Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Mark Beaumont. Mark is a record-breaking long-distance cyclist, adventurer, broadcaster, documentary maker and author. At the age of 12 you cycled across Scotland and by the time you were 15 you had pedalled your way from John O'Groats to Land's End. Your first major expedition was a decade ago and it was a circumnavigation world record cycle. The cycle was unsupported and took 82 days off the previous best time in a journey that was captured for the BBC and in the book The Man Who Cycled the World. Since then, you've continued to make history by cycling and climbing the Americas, rowing the Arctic, attempting to break the mid-Atlantic rowing world record and surviving a life-threatening capsize, leading the BBC coverage ahead of the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games and setting a world record for the fastest sole ride of Africa. Most recently, inspired by the story by Jules Verne, you undertook an utterly astonishing Around the World in 80 Days Challenge, which concluded on the 18th of September 2017, ahead of schedule, completing it in 78 days, 14 hours and 40 minutes, set two world records and shattering the previous record by 44 days. In doing so, you raise funds for Orchid Studio, an organisation which aims to benefit communities around the world by providing innovative infrastructure, and you received a British Empire Medal in recognition of your efforts. Mark, it's absolutely phenomenal to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, we last spoke, uh, we were speaking about this just before we started. It was more than two years ago uh, that you were last in the chair. We were interviewing under a different name, but uh, not much has, has really changed since then. Certainly in your life, a lot has changed. It's the same chair. <laughs> it's the same chair. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to uh, hearing all about you know what, what you've been up to, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. So for people you know who maybe haven't seen our first interview, who aren't uh, necessarily completely familiar with Mark Beaumont, uh, if you can just give a kind of introduction as to your early life, you know how that kind of uh, shaped you, and, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of having this whole conversation in the third person. I should talk about Mark as if he's over here. <laughs> uh, Mark, Mark does this. Um, the last couple of years has been has been pretty full on. I mean, around the world in eighty days was my Everest. You know, mm -hmm. it was it was my biggest dream as a, as an athlete. I came off the back of Glasgow twenty fourteen, where I was the the lead presenter for um, for the games in the build up. You know, mm -hmm. telling the story of hundreds of athletes who who were all excited to to come and compete here in Scotland. And I sat down with my family and. I said, I'm not done yet. I can't take myself out of the equation. I want to be doing what they are doing. You know, I was holding the microphone and hearing, you know, all that that great fight, that inspiration, that you know, drive to figure out their personal best. And I was like, I want to be doing what they are doing. Hmm. And the compromise for me is that I always felt like there was a, I always felt like there was a, a conflict between the wild man element of all the adventures I'd done, you know, where am I going to sleep tonight, where's my next meal, and the mm -hmm. sheer performance, mm -hmm. like what is possible if you take away all the variables, um, the unknowns. So the last two, three years, I mean, I guess kind of since we last caught up, have been very clear for me, get rid of all the unknowns, all the, all the wild man element of the expedition, and as a performance athlete, put all my cards on the table and figure out what is the ultimate, <laughs> full support, and you know, absolutely about how far, how fast, what is possible with a well-financed professional team. Mm -hmm. And it's the ultimate. You know, who was the second person to run a four-minute mile? Who was the second person to climb Everest? You know, to be the first to get around the world in 80 days is such a yes. It's smashing the old world record by nearly 40 percent. But for me, it's a one-time prize, and you don't need to be a PR genius to get that. That's true. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I, I might have asked this beforehand, but it might have been a bit of a curveball not expecting it. When I read that out, you know, and you hear all of these achievements and all of these uh, accolades, what does it make you feel? Um, I mean, that's an interesting question because when you're, when, when you're on a journey, when you drive a career in a business like I do, um, you don't get a ton of perspective on what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I go to events all the time, you know, where I, s or I, you know, s go on social media and see other people's reaction to what I've done. And there's often quite a void between how other people perceive me and how I see myself. You know, I'm just doing what I'm passionate about. You know, I've, I go home and I walk the dog and I change nappies and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dad, I'm husband, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm training furiously, I'm trying to do a hundred things a day like most of us. 
uh, I've got a sort of quite a, a diverse career now, you know, a portfolio career of corporate work, you know, charity, uh, pro bono work, uh, educational work, and as an athlete and a broadcaster. So mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer to your simple question is, I don't really think I've got a view on, on who Mark Beaumont is. Who is that guy? Um, <laughs> because for, for, for me, I've just been so furiously doing it, just getting busy with it. You know, I was a, an economics and politics graduate 12 years ago from mm -hmm. the University of Glasgow. And I'll put it in simple terms. I didn't plan to do this. You know, I've got, f I've got furiously busy with what's in front of me. You know, I didn't, I didn't imagine having the career I've got. I, I, I imagined becoming an accountant and then working in finance and, and doing what the 300 in my class of economics graduates, you know, did, becoming, um, you know, you know work, 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 working in the city. Um, simply because I didn't have any reference points for what, uh, what a career like this could look like. I didn't understand that by building a profile around what you do, um, you know, leveraging the network around you and, mm. and, and, and building sort of a business alongside, you know, what is a passion, the sport, and mm. then the broadcast elements. You know, those three hats, if, if, if I was an athlete, a broadcaster, and, and the corporate world, you know, how, how you can build, you know, all these opportunities and, and also the freedom of time mm -hmm. to commit to things that, that you're interested in. So I think if you look back on, on the last 12 years, it almost looks inevitable because there's a clear chronology, you know, there's one project quite clearly leads on to the next, you know, yeah. there, there's a logic to it. Yeah. But that logic is only clear in retrospect. And even if I give you the last couple of years since we caught up, um, I was chatting to the, the editor in, in Cape Town for the, for the Around the World in 80 Days documentary, and he came on after the event. Uh, so, you know, I'd finished in September and then he was given 150 hours of rushes and said, make a documentary. <laughs> and, he f and we had a call at one point and he said, well, one of the challenges we're having with this documentary, Mark, is that you did exactly what you said you would do. And with that, you know, there's not that sort of cliffhanger, hanger, that, that jeopardy or the willy won't you. Like, it, it was clinical. <laughs> and I said, well, in that sense, yes, but you're looking at it with the you know, with, with hindsight, you're, yeah. you know, in anything which gives a sense of inevitability or flow or purpose or certainty is a false reality mm. because you're looking back. What it felt like building this project, you know, the, the uncertainty, the setbacks, the, the fear, the, and I think it's like anyone who, who, who builds their own career and their own, their own projects. It's, <coughs> it's scary. It's tough. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, again, that conversation with, with the editor is, I think, the same for, for my career so far. If it looks sure-footed, if it looks successful in any sense, it's not how it's felt during the journey. <laughs> and I'm certainly not sitting in a throne going, going I've made it. You know, there's, there's always that sense of, well, I've done that, so where does that lead? And how do I create new opportunities? And I don't think anyone's as omniscient to sort of hover over their own existence and go, wow, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's great, you've done it. You've not, because cause you're in it. Yeah, yeah. And you're, well, being, a, I suppose, a high-performance individual, you're always looking ahead as well. You know, you're always looking mm. for the, the next achievement, the next thing you can do. Um, I, I, I mean, I agree with that up to a point, but, but, but I would say that as an athlete, mm -hmm. I'll always need to get my fix. You know, I love getting out there, getting mm. the endorphins and training. But this is the first time in my career, you know, you're catching me at an interesting point because this is the first time in my career where I've, I don't have that itch to scratch in terms of the, you know, ultra endurance. That there was always that, I didn't want to, you know, that classic ask your 70 year old self. <laughs> in 2014 when I did that after the Commonwealth Games, you know, I, I, I had that very clear conversation. My 70 year old self, looking back, didn't want to not Put all, didn't have the opportunity to put all my cards on the table and figure out the ultimate. I could be a TV presenter in 10 years time. I couldn't cycle around the world in 80 days in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a clear time and place to do different things in your career. So, um, you know, catching up now, as an endurance athlete, for the first time in my career, I don't feel like there's a what next. I mean, mm -hmm. there'll be other stuff for fun, Mm -hmm. You know, I'll push myself in interesting ways, but I'm not going to cycle around the world for a third time. You know, I, I, I genuinely feel like I've taken that part of my career and my passion to the limit.
you know, we absolutely suffered out there. I mean, that was absolutely brutal. So it, it is interesting, as you say, driving a career and sort of constantly thinking, what's next, what's mm -hmm. next? But also for one strand, just to say, you know, that's enough. That was my Everest, mm. you know. <laughs> There's other opportunities kind of off the back of that, but I don't, try and, I don't need to try and beat that. Yeah, that yeah. Just, just be happy, leave that in its place. This, but w what's really interesting is that there's very much a sense of contentment with that. You know, it's, yeah. it's reminiscent, I suppose, when I know that when Johnny Wilkinson, after winning the World Cup, because that was very much the pinnacle of his career, anything that he did after that just didn't have the same sense of, yeah. you know, like... And it doesn't make me complacent because I've got that hunger to put the same methodology, the same mindset, the same purpose yeah. to different projects in mm. completely different ways. Mm -hmm. But as an endurance athlete, it's it's hard to beat. I mean, where do you go? <laughs> I mean, it's around the world in 80 days. I'm not being, you know, immodest yeah. about it, but it, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's the ultimate. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> I, I am aware of how, how lucky I was to create the, the opportunities, the, you know, the freedom to do that. Yeah. You know, that is a rare combination of 20 years of yeah. of training, building the confidence, the physical ability, and then at the end of it, you know, actually having the profile to build the finance, the mm -hmm. professional team around me, the logistics, the media. You know, I, mm. I, I mean, I train with people who are better bike riders than me. You know, being a good cyclist is, is just one component part of a big project like that. So I don't take for granted how difficult it is and how long it takes to create the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a firm believer in shoot for the stars. I'm a firm believer in, you know, absolutely, you know, take on what you think is, is your ultimate dream. But I'm also a firm believer in learning your trade. So this idea that you can just fall out of bed and be good at something doesn't, doesn't work. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's pop fiction. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I was a 12 year old kid who pedaled across Scotland. You know, I'm now 35 years old. I've been on this journey for a long time and I just feel lucky that I, you know, created the opportunity and I've got a support network around me that allowed me to, to take on, you know, the ultimate. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. I'm keen to dig into um, the world cycle, you know, some of the experiences, etc. Th the first question I have is really about when the idea was first conceived. I mean, when we spoke, you kind of alluded to yeah. something was happening. Um, I suspect that your uh, cycle of Africa was a kind of test run in some respects yeah. as to what could be done. What was the very first time that you thought are in the world in 80 days? <laughs> um, so when the 11 days of sport finished in Glasgow, I sat down with my family and I said, I'm not done yet. I'm coming back to being an athlete. So I, I, rather than you know, carrying on being a broadcaster and a TV presenter, you know, I'm, I'm getting back on the bike. And, and, I, and I made it very clear at that point, so we're talking August 2014, if I'm getting back to being a professional cyclist, it's for one prize and one prize only, and that's the world. Everything is small talk compared to the world. You know, why is the circumnavigation by bicycle not as coveted and as professional as the around the world sailing record. It should be, considering mm -hmm. the scale of the sport. Mm -hmm. You know, let's think of the history here. 12 years ago when I first set out to break the around the world record, mm -hmm. it, it stood at 276 days. I mean, I don't wish to be disparaging <laughs> about somebody who's gone 18,000 miles, but that's yeah. pretty slow. Um, and so- It's the greatest quote I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 I mean, you know, what's going on there? You know, that, that was not a serious record. And, um, you know, considering it's now less than 80. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's you know, that's not a marginal gain. Uh, so, so I've been, I've been, you know, very proud to be part of that history over the last 12 years. Many other people have contributed in a significant ways, guys and girls, you know, taking chunks off the record, taking it to the next level, making it more and more professional. It was most recently held by Andrew Nicholson, a, um, a retired uh, Olympian, uh, a New Zealander phenomenal athlete and a real character, to very different for me in character, um, but uh, yeah, I got a lot of time for Andrew. And so I looked at what he had done and I thought, well, how can you once again create a leap in performance? So for three years from the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, that was the plan. Hmm. But I realized that you'd be naive to come straight back to the world having not done anything serious. I mean, I'd lived in hotels and airports for two years. You know, I was, I was in the worst shape of my life. So I wanted to do something high profile to capture the imagination, to give me the credibility to, to then step up and, and build the team and the, the funding for the world. 
but I needed to give myself the confidence and the training to 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 work back towards that 18,000 miles. Yeah. So that's why I set my sights on Africa. Mm -hmm. I'd spent two months uh, traveling through the, the 18 Commonwealth countries in Africa during the the Queen's Baton Relay, the Commonwealth Games journey. So I'd, I'd absolutely love that. And one mm. year seeing it, you know, with the red carpet out, you know, very much, you know, traveling with BBC World and, you know, meeting all the, you know, British, uh, British ambassadors and consulates and athletes and at that level. Mm. And then the next year going back and seeing Africa at the grassroots, you know, Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia, mm -hmm. Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, South Africa, living wild, living in truck stops, you know, <laughs> in the Ethiopian highlands. It was just wonderful. Just the friendship of strangers. If I was to go back and explore one continent, it would be, it would be Africa. And I took that record from 59 days down to 41 days, 10 hours and 22 minutes. Um, but for me, even though for the public that was seen as a standalone project, that was a that was my building block back to the world. So yeah. that was 2015. 2016 was do a lot more testing, training. You know, I had a researcher working for an entire year on figuring out the optimal 18,000 miles, mm -hmm. the optimal team, the finance, all the budget side, and then starting to build that team, recruit the team leaders, the performance managers, all the comp and getting them to recruit their teams. There was about 40 people involved in the project, all told, and a big budget and. You know, that hadn't been done before. Um, so I wasn't trying to replicate what people had done. And I was always very clear that this was not a like for like. You know, mm -hmm. I, was, I was very much doing this, you know, fully supported, you know, race style. Mm -hmm. And that hadn't been done. Mm -hmm. So around the world in 80 days, when we got close to that in terms of the planning, when my initial thinking after the, the the Africa solo record was sub 100 for the world hmm. and then with a lot more planning and testing we started to speculate sub 90 okay. and then when we got sub 90 I sort of put it back on my team and I said if we can even dream of going sub 80 we have to figure out how it can't be pie in the sky it has to be worked out mm -hmm. and we had 18,000 miles broken down into four hour blocks mm -hmm. so it can't be you know a ridiculous target but if that is in any way possible, it has to be what we are targeting. It is such an iconic target. Mm -hmm. I love the history of these things. I mean, I love, hmm. you know, uh, if you look at a lot of my expeditions, there's always that sort of romantic side to it, you know, looking back at where it's come from, either fact or fiction, fiction whether that's recreating a World War I special forces operation or, you know, in a couple of weeks' time I'm going for you know, the penny farthing arrow record, which was <laughs> set in 1883. You know, I love the history of things. And, um, you know, around the world in 80 days, Phileas Fogg, I mean, one of the yeah. first talk I did when I came back from, um, you know, smashing the world record was at the Reform Club in London. You know, I wanted to, to yeah. sort of, in some ways, walk in the footsteps of that, of that fiction and tell yeah. them actually how you did really got around the world in 80 days. Um, <laughs> but it's um, the, the, the challenge that I, faced quite a lot through 2016, early 2017, when I went and tried to get supporters for this, was considering the world record stood at 123 days, the sentiment from a number of would-be supporters and, and partners was, why don't you just try and break the record? And then if you really are capable of going sub-80, make that the punchline. Because mm -hmm. the, 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 the feeling was, if I came home in 81 days or 91 days, I'd have failed. And so quite a lot of people didn't want me to go out there day one and call the trip around the world in 80 days, put it on the shirt, put it on the bike, call it around the world in 80 days. Hmm. And I thought about that, you know, and there was a lot of money on the table, you know, this is about getting sponsors on board. And I, I felt two things. I thought, first of all, if we make 123 days in any way part of our language, part of our culture, part of what is acceptable, our reference point for success, if you like, mm -hmm. there's no way we're ever going to hit 80. 80 is so difficult. The margins are so small. Mm. You have to work with such intent and momentum that if 123 days is in, in any way part of your vocabulary, there's no way you're going to hit 80. So that mm. I couldn't do that to my team. And the second part is, you know, when I got into this game 12 years ago and first picked up a camera for the BBC, it was all about living a journey and then packaging it up afterwards as a documentary, a book, a talk tour. And it was all very sort of, you know, formulaic. Um, mm -hmm. 
and you knew the story before you told it. The world has moved on. And you know, I completely got the fact that earned media value, return on investment for sponsors and partners is created in real time. So I knew that if the 80 days was possible, we had to go out and say that day one, not on the, end, on the finishing day. Mm. And so rather than launching the project years ago, like the last time I spoke to you, and this was something that was gonna happen in the future, the moment we launched the project last April, mm -hmm. we had a story day one because not just did we announce that we were going to go around the world in 80 days, really sort of nail our reputations and our claim to the wall, mm. but we also set out that morning on a 3,000 mile training round around the coastline of Britain. That's right, yeah. So, so <laughs> it was on home soil, it felt like a victory lap before we did anything, but it just gave people content and a talking point from day one. Mm. So from that point, we had 200 days of real-time storytelling until the finish in Paris, around mm. Britain, nine weeks planning and prep, and then off we go. So all the sponsors and partners got to the finishing line in Paris, having realized massive, you know, earned media value. And then the, round the, the fact that we did actually come around the world in 80 days, <laughs> which I knew, I knew we could, um, became the icing on the cake, as opposed to being the cake. So understanding how media has changed and how you leverage that is hugely important. And those that sat on the fence and sort of said, oh, we need to protect ourselves from a fail and we need to be worried about what happens at the finishing line. I said, if I came home in 81 days, you'll have already seen so much value through the intrigue, through the interest, through the willy won'ty and, and, and the, the sheer ambition of this project that um, you, really don't need to, you really don't need to worry about what happens at the end, mm -hmm. you know, stop focusing on that moment in time and that press release as your value piece. Um, and I think that's just realizing how media has changed. Mm -hmm. But it can't be pie in the sky. It has to be a mm -hmm. real, a real target. So you know, I was always pretty passionate and clear on the eighty days. <laughs> Excellent. Some quick stats, uh, just about the the trip itself. Um, I'm not sure. If people will, will know all of this. You woke, and, and I don't know, I, I'm assuming this is correct. <laughs> you woke at 4 a.m. every morning. You averaged 240 miles a day. You ate 9,000 calories a day. You slept five hours a night, and you were on the bike for over 16 hours a day. Yeah. What was the, the biggest <laughs> challenge that you faced? Um, I was on the bike at four o'clock, so you're at your scratcher at half three. So at your scratcher at half three, on the bike at four, four times four hour sets. And the thing is, if you're, a, if you're a very good bike rider, you might be able to imagine doing a 240. I mean, 240 is a big stint. I mean, yeah. we're, we're sitting here in Edinburgh. You could get, you could get just across the Welsh border. Um, wow. It's a long way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but 240 miles is not your best day, and it's not a one-off effort. It's your average day, yeah. and you have to do that every single day for the next two and a half months. Something I stress with the team is if we, if we faff, you know, it's a technical term, but if we faffed for, <laughs> for five minutes every time I was off the bike, that would add well over a day to the world record. So yeah. the discipline, you know, on the bike at five past four was unacceptable. It was that control what you can control. Um, you know, one mm -hmm. day that would take you 220 miles, the next day it would take you 280 miles because of topography, wind conditions, border crossings, all the stuff you can't affect. Mm. So the most important thing for us was, you know, ride time, sleep pattern, food and hydration. Those are four things you can affect. And then you just trust that the long-term average will take care of itself. So it doesn't matter what is happening, you've just got absolute obsession and discipline around the parts you can affect. And it, and it worked. I mean, the, the hardest part was, people always imagine it's the crisis points. Mm -hmm. You know, the crashes, the incidents, the accidents. Which you had. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, and inevit inevitably you're gonna have, I mean, you mm -hmm. know. But, I think as humans, we've got a pretty good inbuilt fight or flight mechanism. You know, I think, you know, the natural endorphins and response from, you know, being scared, being cornered, being in a crisis it, it is pretty powerful. I think what's less exciting, less of a headline in the paper, less of a talking point, but what's much, much harder to deal with is the sheer battle of attrition. Mm -hmm. is the sheer longevity and grind mm -hmm. of big projects. And I don't care whether you're building a business or cycling around the world, it's what does it feel months in when there's not a crisis point? There's, 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 there's no, there's no um, fight or flight, there's no crisis point. It's just the sheer discipline of doing what is necessary because every day counts. And that's what's overseen because it doesn't make very exciting talk. I mean, even 
mentioning it now and boring myself, but you know, you know, you know, you're you're two months in, you're coming through the prairies, up through the Great Lakes, heading towards the east coast of Canada, and nothing's happening. But you still gotta get up at half past three and focus on another sixteen hour day and think your way through it. That's the hardest part. How do you have that level of discipline? The fear of failure? Is it, it really? Yeah. You build success in a project. The more momentum you build, the more success you build. The you know the more if you don't if you don't make it count in any one day, it's all for nothing. Mm -hmm. On day one, you've got everything to create. Two three months in, um, I saw that with my team. You know, people not working at their best because nobody wanted to be the one to drop the ball. You know, you just build such profile and such expectation and such success in the project. Everyone's going, wow, nobody wants to mess up now. But, you know, that builds and builds and builds the tension and it's the fear of failure. Now, in that sense, whether it's driving the project to the start line, I mean, last January, February, March, I had over 200,000 drop out the project in sponsorship. And I was having serious conversations with, you know, Nikki, my wife, and and my my, my team about do we need to postpone by a year? Mm. You know that that is scary. You know that's really scary. Uh, you know you're physically in shape. You've got the logistics in place. You're committed in almost every sense, but you just yeah. don't have the money to do it. Mm. And I said, look, we are doing this. You know, you put a timeline on it, and you will make a way. If you don't put timelines on things, then time just passes. Mm. And um, you know, I had to. I had to really scramble in those last months. Do th you know I should have been focused on being the full-time athlete, but you know I had to really scramble around and, and plug the gaps and put some of my own money into it. There's nothing like having some skin in the game, yeah. and um, <laughs> you know that sense of being fully committed. So I mean, you know, how do you keep going? What's it like? I don't. I think I'm a very positive person in the sense that I like setting targets on my own terms. You know, I have the confidence to. To, to do things very differently from what's gone before. Mm -hmm. But I think when I'm actually within a project, um, you know, I'm actually absolutely driven by the fear of, of failure, the commitment, the professional pressure that if I fail, everyone fails. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got an amazing team around me. I've got one job, but ultimately it's still on me, you know, as the team lead. Um, mm -hmm. So when I'm having a crisis point, when I'm two months in and I'm struggling to get on the bike at four o'clock in the morning, you know, with all due respect, don't give me a Muhammad Ali quote. I don't know what to do with that. I'm not an inspired person when, you know, you've got to call it out, you know, a yeah. shit day feels shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, people often think when they are inspired by other people's life journeys, they sort of think, well, they must be a very inspired person. You've got to know what it's like to suffer. You've really got to know, and that's not a, a glorious heroic statement. Mm -hmm. That's genuinely just calling it what it is. To succeed in anything in life, it's going to hurt, but that's okay. And there's something wonderful about that sense of purpose and commitment, and mm -hmm. knowing that um, you know the toughest days or the toughest weeks or the toughest months define the success of the whole project. Because anyone can do the easy days. Um, so that whole type two fun, knowing you know how you commit to stuff, which is not art utterly enjoyable in the moment, but will define your career, will define the project, mm -hmm. um, is ultimately what it takes. And I and I think I think having that sort of I think having that mindset when it gets difficult is is pretty important. I mean I think I think the people I think the people who work with me on my team will all reflect that uh, I'm quite a, quite a tough person to work with um, mm. in the sense that when it gets difficult, you know, my tolerance for you know diversion or or anything but purpose and and and, and momentum is, is 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 nil because i feel very acutely the consequence for 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 failing and everyone needs to be on the same page mm -hmm. wow <laughs> how close did you come to throwing in the towel i never seriously i i i never the important thing to realise is, by the time we got to that period of performance, that two and a half months on the road, I had one job, and that was to ride the bike. So I'd, I'd had put together the team. You know, my mum works full time with me, and she does an absolutely pivotal job running base camp. So a huge amount of the conversations are coming through through mum. Um, everyone else who we've recruited and put in place 
the important thing is to hand over the reins to them and then don't take back the reins. As, mm. you know, it's their job to get me around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have the skill set, the capacity to coordinate the projects on the road. I'm just the bike rider now. And you have to do that. Because so often with projects, you see people trying to sort of hand over responsibility and, and, and leadership, but then when things don't go quite right, take it back and then give it, and then give it back. It, do, it doesn't work yeah. like that. You undermine the authority and the accountability that you're trying to set up. So build the team, trust the team, hand them the reins. What we've just spoken about, feeling the consequence, knowing, you know, knowing what it feels like on those tough days, they've got to feel that. They can't just, on the tough days, go, well, this is on mark. You know, we'll do our job and then we'll, 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 we'll just get through today. They've got to feel it. They've got to, they've got to know that it's on them to get me around the world. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting dynamic by the time you build the team up like that. But mm. I, I don't want to overstate my role. By the time it comes to racing, I just ride the bike. Everyone else has to worry about everything else. Yeah, but, but of course you're putting an enormous amount of trust in the people around you. Yeah, yeah. but you've got to. Yeah. You would utterly fail if you tried to do everything. Mm. I mean, how many businesses and projects fail because one person tries to make all the decisions and, and not just have the skill set and the responsibility of, of the project, but sort of shoulder all that, um, the emotional uh, expectation and pressure. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, you know you're setting the tone for the entire. It's really really important that the people around you have that sort of a emotional even keel, so that people are looking to each other as opposed to just looking to one person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really interesting dynamic once you once you get into it, and I think because I work these projects on t such tight such tight timelines, it. In its nature, in its by its nature, just you get rid of the noise. You, mm -hmm. you you know, it becomes very clear what makes the bike go faster. You know, how do we keep this on budget? You know, where are the logistics in terms of what is relevant? It's sort of you you lose all the, you know, people are always busy, and they tend to busy themselves with the things that they are most comfortable doing. So I think it's a real skill set to get people to focus on what's most important to the project, even if it's outside of their, their core skill set, because you only keep relevance by building tight timelines, you know, because it's just human nature. We mm. keep ourselves busy. You know, you never get to the end of a week and sit there in their pub and, and your mate says, oh, I had, a pretty, I had a pretty relaxed week. You know, they say, oh, I had a mental week. It was like, yeah. But being busy is very different from being relevant, and mm. and 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 building building projects on timelines, you know, and and having that leadership in terms of right, that is yours, that is yours, you know, we're in, you know, we're going to make sure that we don't work in silos. So, you know, there's going to be good communication, but it's on you, you know, and, and and that level of accountability is is so important with a project like this, because otherwise you would build a perfect plan get out there and just crumble because you don't have the capacity or the skill set to run it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Th there's a lot of quotes as to how it felt like completing it. Um, <laughs> and obviously, you know, very satisfied is, is probably how you felt. So I'm not, I'm not going to kind of go over that sort of stuff. I think relieved. Uh, yeah, that. yeah. Um, purely from my own curiosity, I mean, had you been unsuccessful, yeah. would you have ever gone after it again? I think that's an impossible question. Yeah, it's such an it's such a commitment. It's such a, and I knew it'd be the hardest thing I'd ever done, but to rationally commit to that again, having done it, I think would be quite hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, human nature is to sort of f to forget the pain and the suffering, but it's it's all still quite raw. I mean, we're only talking about six seven months ago, mm. and you know, that level of sleep deprivation, that level of hurt, um, it's, it's hard to imagine putting myself through it again. Even though I wasn't naive going into it, mm -hmm. uh, I knew it would be tough, I knew it would be next level. Um, having done it, uh, it would be hard to, and that's why, I think the only way I can really answer it is, you know, whoever goes next, <laughs> I'll have, I will really sort of, off my cap because it won't be about their ability to ride a bike or their ability to have funded it or have got a professional team. That commitment to to suffer, that commitment to, to sort of pit yourself against such a, 
a mental and physical battle is, is something I've got a huge amount of respect for. And again, I, I hope that doesn't come across as a hero statement. It's not meant to be. I just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I stand up regularly and have the opportunity to talk about this. And you sort of reel it off, 240 miles a day, 80 days, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and it just all sort of rolls off the tongue. Mm -hmm. But I think only the team that were with me on the road and I, you know, not even Nikki, my wife, not even you know, my mom, not even the people who are closest to me can fully understand what that is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the level of commitment and the level, well, they'll get the level of commitment, but just the sheer, the sheer scale of these days. You know, if I think of a singular day, it scares me. If I think of a week, it just, you know, I just, the fear of, of the, the, you know, the, but if I think of a singular unit, you know, four hours and what I actually need to do in terms of wattage and output on the bike and the performance, I can get my head around that. Mm -hmm. um, so whoever goes next, I think it's the, uh, the courage, the audacity, you know, the lunacy to commit to the task. Mm -hmm. um, if I'd failed, would have I gone for it again? The emotional journey to get back on that bike would have been quite incredible. Mm -hmm. I remember there was points getting through the first month when my team turned to me and said, you're gonna do this. And I said, yeah, of course we're gonna do this. <laughs> because I always knew, in, unless I injured or something you know, went seriously wrong in terms of flight patterns or logistics, I knew that the plan was sound. Mm -hmm. So it was just about executing the plan. It mm -hmm. wasn't the romantic notion of let's get out there and figure out what we're made of. There was nothing left to chance. It was all about reading this off script. We came home within hours of what we said we would. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting, you know, I've lived in, in my shoes doing what I do since I was a 12 year old kid. So mm -hmm. that was a rational, um, a rational thought. But for some of the team that I'd brought on, you know, they've not lived in my shoes, so they were buying into my belief, my mm -hmm. plan. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting, in leadership, so often people go, right, we want to, everyone to be a part of the plan, to understand it from day one and to really sort of drive it. That's nonsense. That's what leadership is. You know, what you do is you recruit people who have got a technical skill set and an ambition and a, you know, an ability to do their part. And at some point along the journey, the penny will drop and it'll add up. Mm -hmm. You know, how often do you get, you know, big organisations where, you know, you unrealistically think that somebody who is in a completely different role to you is going to understand the risks, the rewards, and the big picture the way you see it. So mm -hmm. it's interesting, and I'm riding out the Gobi Desert, and Alex, my mechanic, turns to me and says, you're going to do this. Like, yeah, of course we're going to do this. Of course we're going to do this. But the penny drops for different people at different points in time. Mm -hmm. And cracking the one-month record um, as we hit Australia, I think, was a really important milestone for the team because it gave them a tangible rung on the ladder. It gave them a mm -hmm. moment in time where they could look at each other and go, all that effort, all that hard work, all that sleep debt, you know, it's worth something. Mm -hmm. Whereas I completely bought into and believed the plan. Everyone else was ultimately just believing in me and they needed some proof. They needed some evidence to actually sort of start to think, okay, right, we get it, you know. Amazing. I'll give you an opportunity at this stage to speak a bit about your book. I know that that is uh, in the pipeline around yeah. the world in 80 days. Uh, what can people sort of expect from that? I've just finished writing it. So it's, it's going to be published, um, well, people might be watching this at different points yeah, in time. Yeah, of course, yeah. But, it's, it, um, but speaking as we are now, it's going to be published at the end of July. Mm -hmm. And this was my fourth book and my hardest to write. My other three books, whilst I've been in a hurry and sort of trying to go with a first or a fastest, They've still been at a pace where there's still a travelogue element. You know, I'm still meeting interesting people. It's about the food and the cultures and the geography and the places. So the other three have been around, you know, um, the man who cycled the world, the man who cycled the, the Americas, mm -hmm. nine month expedition and an Africa solo. The issue with this one and what makes it so different is I didn't meet anyone. I didn't stop. It's not about the people, the places, the cultures. It is mm. an out and out race. So in that sense, it's one more, far more one-dimensional. Up, up, past three, on the bike at four, ride 16 hours, eat 9,000 calories, sleep five hours, repeat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if my publishers had said, could you write a book for a business audience, which is around building a team performance, 
you know, the blueprint for, you know, how you define that, you know, smash a world record by 40 percent in a in quite a clinical way. I could have written that book. That would be fairly straightforward. But writing a bedtime story, a first person narrative, yeah. an engaging story, which, you know, everything from kids to people who don't care about cycling to, you know, people, it doesn't matter, you're just a general reading mm -hmm. adventure book. That is harder when this was ultimately just an absolute, you know, performance yeah. race. So I, I only had four months to write the book. Okay. And that was four months when I was out doing events, you know, four, five, six times a week. So it, was, it felt like an expedition in itself to write. <laughs> yeah. And it's only in the last five days that I've handed that over to some of my team, to, you know, Laura Penhall, uh, David Scott, um, uh, Mike Griffiths, you know, the, the core members of my team and got their feedback. And it's a very vulnerable feeling when you write a book, a personal account of what is everyone's story. You know, imagine everyone in my team has their version of, 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 of what happened. And I can only write my perspective on what happened. But so where so many of my stories before have just been a solo journey. You know, I was tr somehow trying to capture the scale of the project, the people involved and the complexity. Mm -hmm. Often when I had no awareness at the time of what was going on, it was just being done for me and I was just riding the bike. Mm. But the feedback from my publisher is great. I had breakfast with him last week. He really enjoys it. Giles Elliott, he did a f you know, I've worked with him for 10 years and he, it's great having, that's my only connection with the publishing world. You know, my, having an editor who you really trust mm -hmm. and then getting that initial feedback from my core team saying that they like it is just a huge relief, <laughs> you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And gives me the reassurance. I mean, Alex Glasgow, um, one of my team, he, I gave him the book and he stayed up till four o'clock and read it in a one hour. Oh. And that gives me the, the reassurance that, um, you know, you do keep turning the pages. It isn't just a, an Adrian Mole diary. You know, I got up, I ate breakfast, I cycled my bike, I went to bed. You know, it, 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 it moves on. It doesn't, it doesn't put the reader through the same feat of endurance that I went through. You know, it, it somehow tells the story whilst also being an engaging book. Excellent. <laughs> I look forward to reading we, it. We will see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I don't. I don't think it's going to be for any everyone. It's, okay. uh, it's not a. Yeah, I don't think it's a light-hearted read, <laughs> but hopefully the reader doesn't need to suffer too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some questions which are the sort of larger, more philosophical ones, uh, which I, which I'll ask. Um, the first of which is really about, I suppose, purpose. You've mentioned the word purpose a lot less so in the context of what has been the sort of purpose of your life. I mean, what do you feel, you know, sitting here today, reflecting back, what do you think has been sort of your, your main purpose? I feel that I've had the chance to, for two decades, build um, to the absolute sort of ultimate, you know, a, a core passion and a purpose. For me, I'm a, you know, that kid that never grew up and just wanted to figure out his personal best. Mm -hmm. As an athlete, that is a rare opportunity. In the last decade, you know, as I've built a public profile around what I do and the team I work with, I've realised and relished the opportunity to, to have a career which, where I can, where I can set the schedule. You know, I now realise in my mid-thirties how few people have the freedom of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm as, I'm as busy as everyone else, but it's a schedule that I'll set. So you'll never hear me complaining about being busy. Mm. And I can, I can leverage what I do for other things that I'm really passionate about. Um, be that in, in education, you know, with, 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 with charity and, and different organisations. And with businesses that I want to drive and build, so I'm. So my purpose, I think, is to create the time to really be there for my family to grow up. Now, I've got two beautiful daughters, my wife. I live here in Edinburgh, and again, I want to feel like I'm in the driving seat for that. You know, I can make those choices, so I can really be around and not always be working for 
a better tomorrow. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm appreciating what, what I have now. And again, that is a, a perspective which is important to hold on to for me. So that, that's the whole charity starts at home and the fact that family is at the core of what I do. Mm -hmm. I work full time with my mum and, uh, you know, Nikki and the kids are absolutely at the heart of it. But I've, I've you know, I've, uh, what, I'm, what I'm really sort of passionate about and the, 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 the drum that I'm constantly banging on with education in Scotland is, is trying to give people, I was going to say young people, but people of all ages, the confidence, and it is confidence, mm -hmm. to pursue the things which make them happy or make them feel fulfilled. And I realise that sounds like sort of cliched <laughs> pie in the sky careers talk, but what I mean by that is I worry a lot about people getting educated into and fast-tracked into careers and lives that they never really paused and had a thought about. Mm. So it's not about having a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, sort of committing to being an X, Y, and or a Z. You know, I don't care whether you work for the world's biggest corporation or you ply your own furrow, but it's that sense of purpose and realizing the skill sets you have and how that can impact other people. You know, to give back doesn't need to be something you, happen, you do towards the end of your career. You know, having mm. real thought as to how you can give you know, time, money, resources, skill sets to, to things that you're passionate about. That all sounds very vague until you sort of bore down into the specifics of what I do. But I try and create the time each week and each month to work hard on the businesses that I advise on and, and, and work with mm -hmm. so that I can spend quality time with my family. And you, know, you realize there's sort of a community around me that, that are working very hard on lots of different projects in the corporate world, in the business world, with charities and educational programs that I'm very passionate about, like you know, the Saltire Foundation, Entrepreneurial mm -hmm. Scotland, like being the rector at the University of Dundee, mm -hmm. like being the, the, the charity chair for Orchid Studio, uh, an amazing charity that I've helped uh, grow over the last 11 years. You know, th these are just some, you know, I'm honorary president of Scottish Student Sport. These are things which I'm really passionate about and I, and I want to make an impact with. Mm -hmm. um, so you can only do that if, you, if you've got a real strategy around how you're gonna, how you're gonna use your time well. It's a long answer to a <laughs> short question, but you know, the purpose of it for me is I kind of feel lucky to be in my mid thirties, only 12 years into my career, and have, have the opportunity to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, and I say as an athlete, I don't need to beat last year. I'll get out there and I'll take on lots of fun stuff, but not always professionally, just you know, for, 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 for fun. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm so looking forward to the next chapter where I get to you know, put that same, you know, that same purpose, mm -hmm. to use your word, and that, mm -hmm. same, that same drive to, to lots of different projects, mm. you know, both, both businesses and, and, and charities. Yeah, um, well, I'm really excited to see what you achieve you know, putting the same level of uh, yeah. effort and intensity into that, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, looking, uh, I suppose, ahead, I mean, how would you like to be remembered? What would you kind of like your legacy to be? I don't think I get a choice in that. I'll always be that guy that cycled around the world. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> quickly. Quickly, though. <laughs> uh, you think yeah. that's... Yeah. Yeah? Are, are, you, are you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. If, that, if that's the way people know me, that's fine. Uh, it's interesting when I sit down and, and do some of the other work because, you know, if I'm doing non-exec work or advisory work or, or working in, in businesses, you know, I quite often get to my second or third meeting and, and I'm talking about something to do with the business and people go, are you not a cyclist? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do ride a bike. Um, so, I'm a, you know, as far as the public is concerned, I'm that guy that rides a bike, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, when we last spoke, uh, I asked you what was the best piece of advice you'd ever received, and you'd said it during the interview, and it stands to this day one of the very favourite pieces of advice that I've ever had. Become somebody who gets paid for who you are and what you do. Does yeah. that still stand? 100%. Yeah? 100%. Great advice. I, I, I'm a firm believer, I said it before, I'm a firm believer in, in learning your trade. You know, this is yeah. not about winging it. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, if you can start to value yourself, promote yourself, spot opportunities, and step into roles which really stretch you, mm. um, you're not waiting for life to promote you. I'm not talking within your specific job. Going has my job has my boss spotted? You know, 
the, you know, the next rung on the ladder for me. <laughs> I just mean in general, it's a great mindset to have, which gives you that sense of purpose and drive, and I'm in the driving seat. You know, yeah. I'm going to create value because of who I am. You know, I'm not just, if, you, if you're a tradesman, you know, you can be a, 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 great, a great joiner. If you're, you know, in the corporate world, you can be a great accountant. But I think once you've been through your education, through your apprenticeship, through whatever you do, um, to, for your entire life to find yourself by your education is very limiting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about those softer skill sets. It's about your ability to communicate. It's about your ability to see, you know, enterprise, to, to see things differently and to sort of create, you know, you know, you know gaps or, 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 or collaborations or, you know, bring other people up or often it's your ability to work under pressure. You know, how, how good are you when you're stressed? Mm -hmm. You know, that cool, calm head, that analytical way, that's nothing to do with your education, but it's what your network and everything I've just described, what's, what makes you irreplaceable in a job. You know, if you are an accountant, it, makes, it means that you're not just an accountant, you're, you're Bob, and, and we need Bob because Bob does all that stuff, which is more than just being good at spreadsheets. Mm. So, yeah, for, for me, I'll always be known as a cyclist, which is fine, but it's not how I define myself. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I believe in our last interview, I asked um, what you would say to your 20-year-old self, so I'm not going to ask you that again. Um, what I'm going to ask you is, um, what would... Uh, what do people not ask you that you wish they would? Um, <laughs> I can think of what people do ask me that I wish they wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Saddle sores, what's next? Um, uh, you're about to ask what's next, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 we'll, we'll wait and see what's next. I'm not going to ask you that. Um, what, do, what, what should people ask me? I mean, it's not, it's not the fault of anyone, um, but people always ask me about cycling around the world, which is great, and I'll talk all day about that. But what I'm equally passionate about is the other parts of what I do. Yeah. Uh, the charity work, the education work, the businesses I work in. Okay. It's less obvious, it's less exciting, maybe it's less relevant to other people. But, um, you know, there's, there's, there's other sides to what I do which I rarely get the opportunity to, to share. Um, which, uh, which are important to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a question, um, I, I've never asked anyone this, but uh, I was looking at questions that Tim Ferriss, who's a renowned podcaster, yeah, yeah, asks yeah. people. Um, and there's one question that I, I quite like at the moment, so I'm gonna ask you it. Um, I believe the question is around, if there was a billboard and you had the opportunity to put anything on that, like a quote or something, what would you put on it? Yeah. It's a good question. It's a question that needs a bit of prep. Yeah. Um, oh, I need to remember it now. Um, no, I'm going to fail. There's a wonderful <laughs> quote. I'm reading a lot of kids' books because I've got okay. two daughters. Yeah. Uh, so I've been reliving some Beatrix Potter. Okay. And there's a lesser known Beatrix Potter book about, uh, and th this is going to be a rubbish punchline because I can't remember the quote. Um, maybe you can find it afterwards but sure. it's uh, it's about uh, a pig who uh, lives a long uh, uneventful life and her end is bacon and it's a it's a lovely quote about uh, not taking risks in life okay. it, it was it was, it's something like mrs. Piggly Winkle whatever her name is mm -hmm. lived a long and a long you know an uneventful life and her end was bacon and I, uh, this, you know, a quote like that, which just makes you look and realise, I don't live forever. Yeah. You know, time is important, and you know, with a bit of a wry smile, get on with the stuff that's important. Love that. But let's find the actual quote. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll look into it. I'll look into that. Um, the last question is a, a very big question. Um, if you could change anything in the world, what would it be, and why? Oh crikey! I mean, I think quite obviously there's there's so much we we would change. Yeah. Um, I want to focus on the positives. 
um, you know, I, I really don't engage in any conversations which polarizes people. You know, I want to be Good. part. Of the, I want to be. I want to be part of the culture for the world that we want to live in, as opposed to, you know, just throwing sticks and stones. Mm-hmm. Um, there's fantastic conversations happening in Scotland about cycling culture, road share. Um, you know how joined up we want Scotland to be for my children and the, the next generations in terms of infrastructure and, and and development. Now again, you can turn that into a very negative conversation, but I am only focused on the very positive things that are happening, the investments that's happening, making sure those conversations are happening in the right places so that in 20, 30 years time when we're all driving around in electric vehicles and cycling a lot more than we are now, mm. that we have the infrastructure and the space to do that well. I mean, I could have, I, I could have talked about, you know, you know, war or plastics or something a bit bigger. But yeah. what I think I, I can actually be a part of and affect change is the country I want to live in in terms of the flow of people. Um, you know, the amount we pollute the planet and how effectively we get around. You know, our beautiful little country. So there is yeah. so much good happening there, and I want to be part of the conversation that creates that change and creates that you know that road share culture. Fantastic. Good, good answer. Good answer. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Mark, uh, it's been fantastic having you back. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed back. <laughs> You're absolutely welcome. I've enjoyed immensely our conversation. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see uh, what's on the horizon for you. <laughs> we'll see you so in a few years. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.